Welcome everyone um, to this month's 2030 session. Um, we'll, we'll give everyone, I know we have, we had about 19 signups, so we'll give everyone about three more minutes to get started. Um, and then we'll, we'll get rolling. Glad to see some familiar plate, familiar faces again. Um, hopefully everyone's summer is going well. We'll give, uh, we'll do one more minute and then we will uh, get started. All right, well, we will get rolling. And if anyone else joins, they'll just come in midstream. Um, thanks everyone for being here today um, with AIA Grand Rapids Committee on the Environment. Um, this is our fourth session in our 2030 series um, on building skin, the importance of thermal envelope. Um, so this is a, where I get excited. I love the technical aspects of all this. And in particular, I think it's it's a spot where we as architects have a lot of control. Um, and I hope some of the things we uh, get out of this is how to connect that downstream to both um, things like daylight and health of occupants and comfort of occupants within our spaces, but also um, understanding the impacts some of our decisions have on other team members like our mechanical engineers and electrical engineers. Um, so with that. Um, today also we have uh, Brent Tranga. I hope I'm pronouncing that right, um, yeah. from Kingspan, um, to who is their director of sustainability um, to help out as well. Um, so some quick learning objectives. Um, we'll, we'll cover relationship between daylight and energy efficiency, um, what the impact of daylight has on human health, identify and evaluate daylighting strategies to optimize energy performance and occupant comfort, and list techniques for effectively managing glare and unwanted heat, heat gain. Um, as always, um, we have to start by thanking our sponsors, particularly our chapter sponsors. Um, we wouldn't be able to do a lot of the programming we do without their support, so we thank them. Um, and then on this, in this event in particular, um, we're fortunate to have Kingspan come alongside us and sponsor this event um, and share Brent's expertise with us. Um, and hopefully everyone has some good questions later and um, we can sort of help address some of those or at least point people in the right direction. Um, so with that, I'll turn over to Brent for an introduction and then we'll get started. Yep, okay, perfect. Let me share that. 
you guys can see my screen. Um, and again, yes, thank you so much for the opportunity. Uh, it's always nice to, we've been doing a, a number of these AI uh, 2030 commitment education series. So just want to walk you through um, a little bit from the manufacturer side. Obviously the design, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a recovering architect myself, so I can, I feel the, the burden and the pain and the challenge on that side. But want to shed some light on what the manufacturing community is doing to support the commitments of AIA and the 2030 challenge, specifically around obviously high performance envelopes and, and embodied carbon. Um, that's a big part of what we do. Um, and really, from, from some of the manufacturers, we've come out and said, you know, as many have made very significant commitments. And we've broken that up into four main categories um, energy, in terms of our energy footprint maintaining a net zero energy status for the company. 60% um, of, of our energy footprint will be direct renewable. So not relying on RECs, but using energy directly from the grid to support our manufacturing sites. 20% of that energy is all generated uh, on-site renewable. So wind and solar and, bio and you know, other systems that are used there, installing PD and wind on all of our sites that we, that we own. Um, and this all, this and the carbon intensity here, you'll see in the second, uh, kind of main focus is reducing the embodied carbon of the products. Obviously, high performance insulation and wall systems are operationally focused embodied carbon um, or operational carbon, but we're focusing on that upfront carbon that the second we make the products, that it's already released and we have to deal with. So we want to be a net zero carbon manufacturer by 2030, uh, zero emissions companies, cars by 2025. And the biggest target for us, and this not only helps Kingspan, but helps the overall manufacturing and supply chain, is a 50% reduction in our CO2, CO2 intensity of our primary suppliers. So steel companies, which have made great efforts and changes in what they're doing, and chemical companies and others that make the products and make the raw materials that go into the manufacturing products that we make. Um, the next, the, the third one there is really circularity. Again, it's great to get it done. Um, but the focus on circularity, re reusing material, um, you know, keeping it in circulation. So zero waste to, to landfill for the entire company globally. I think it's a, a global business. Um, a billion PET bottles recycled or really upcycled into our manufacturing. So, you know, water bottles and, and Coke bottles, et cetera, soda bottles, reusing that PET manufactured down to a high grade polyol and that polyol replaces raw material and goes right into the creation of new insulation for Kingspan. And that goes across all of our quad core products, all of our new high performance insulation that PET will be used. In fact, it's one of the first sites in the US is Modesto, California is using that recycled PET. So high, high recycled steel with, re, with recycled foam or basically allowing recyclability into the foam, it's already been achieved in California. Um, and the last bucket is, is water. Um, we're lucky enough not to have a huge uh, intensity of water in making our materials, but 100 million liters of water harvested by 2030. And then really critical to cleaning up the environment is five ocean cleanup projects by 2030 across the globe. Again, we in Spain, we've actually been able to reclaim some of that plastic out of the ocean, break it back into a pelletized PET, and again, use it into a polyol that can go into our insulation. So that's our that's our kind of primary targets. It directly impacts and helps the buildings you build from an, from an energy from a embodied carbon piece, but it also allows us to make high performance products so you can drive down the operational carbon. Um, we've made great uh, success already, so it's exciting to see that we're not we're not waiting to 2030. We're really trying to dive into this at a, at a, at a rapid rate of what we've done already in 2020. Um, and I would welcome you to, to go check out the Kingspan um, global website for our sustainability, global sustainability report uh, for a bit more information on what we've done and, and really the trajectory of where we're going. So with that, I'll uh, hand it back to Andrew and I'm excited for today's conversation and learning objectives. Thanks, Brent. Um, so just some other quick housekeeping and reminders, and I'll kind of go through these a little quickly as we've seen them quite a few times now, sort of the why behind the 2030 commitment, um, the built environment is responsible for 75% of annual global greenhouse emissions, um, with buildings alone being close to 40% of that. Um, so we have a, in the work that we do, we have an outsized role in helping combat the long-term effects of climate change. Um, 
this is the what is it, you know, just it's a challenge asking the architecture and building community um, to ideally be carbon neutral net zero by 2030. Um, the current threshold is an 80% reduction um, in fossil fuel energy use from the baseline, um, which is the, the CBEX from 2003. Um, so that kicks up to 90% in 2025. Um, you know, the process for signing on to this is you'd go to the DDX, the Design Data Exchange, sign up. Um, as a firm, you would upload your commitment to meet these goals. Um, you'd take, you know, whatever amount of time you want. They ask that within six months, you upload a sustainability action plan of how you're going to achieve these goals. Um, and then you just start reporting projects on the Design Data Exchange. Um, and as a last step, ideally, you're conducting lessons learned on past projects. Um, that's a very brief summary, but it's at least the high level overview of what we're trying to achieve. Um, as always, I'm a broken record with this. I just love this quote from Kennedy about going to the moon. Um, we chose not to go because it was easy, but because it was hard. Um, and I think for me, that's very inspirational because I don't want to do the easy things. I don't any of the architects I know in this community and even building owners that we work for typically are not interested in just doing what's easy. Um, so I, I think it's a good motivator. Um, but with that, we will go ahead and get started. A um, little bit of housekeeping, just please uh, keep your cameras off to help the bandwidth. Um, and then we'll be back in a little bit for Q&A. Thank you. Um, so, um, any questions, I guess, um, we will, uh, feel free to turn your cameras back on. Um, we have Brent here for a little bit. Um, and I don't know if there's any questions right off the gate that people may have. Um, if you want to just raise your hand. Bueller. Brent, did you have any insights or follow up you wanted to share? Um, no, not so much. I mean, um, one thing I just from some courses we've done and some research we've seen, um, it is really, really critical. So we've got great tools like Tally and EC3 that are helping us as we look at the envelope, you know, in terms of that, that, that high efficiency envelope, the difference between envelope systems. And then as you start to get specifically into product specific comparisons like EC3, that's a really critical juncture because um, there's a great tool that um, Payette had put out there. It's called Kaleidoscope. So they published mm -hmm. this free tool where you can say, okay, for like a rain screen system, um, they're taking, you know, masonry and granite and brick and insulated panels and these different components, but it's industry, industry generic data. So specifically in around the insulation, there is a vast difference in the types, the GWP and the carbon intensity of different types of insulation. You've got polyurethane, which could be have a blowing agent with 134A, or it could be 17, 18, 19 kilograms of CO2 per square foot down to something as low as like, in terms of just foam, like panels and things down to something like we have, which is like 3.99 and will be dropping like 25, 50% very quickly here. So really specific to make those early design decisions on a system and then getting very specific about the particular product you may be specking because it will change. You know, there's even XPS, um, mineral fiber, um, cellulose, like it all varies drastically by who's manufacturing it. So just something to keep in mind. And I, I think that would be something, um, something in practice I've been going through lately um, that we're working on in our office is 
really understanding environmental product declarations, um, starting to look at those tools that Brent mentioned, like Tally, EC3, um, some of these embodied carbon tools um, to really make sure we're making um, you know, healthy decisions for our projects um, is critical. And especially um, as Brent's saying, as you start to make assembly decisions, you know, the next layer is specific products and being able to go deeper and compare that I think is critical. Um, yeah, there's a question. Uh, what is uh, some what a question about the insulation industry is taking on the current energy code requirements? <laughs> and then the follow up is pretty much spot on. Asher 90.1 um, and the energy codes, I think, are driving, they're already extremely efficient. Um, in the, in the, the push to get kind of zero energy buildings, it's really going to come down to the detailing. There was a great paper, um, I don't know the exact name of it, by uh, Morrison Hirschfield. They did it a few years ago, but it all comes down to the envelope detailing and thermal bridging. You can have six feet of high, you know, unbelievable insulation. If it's detailed incorrectly and you've got thermal bridging everywhere, it doesn't really matter what's in the wall. Um, so I think it's a combination of systems and detailings and, and product selection. Um, we are at kind of a diminishing return. You know, the EUI intensity is, is really about some other components, not just the materials. What do we see about major barrier to improve design envelopes and why this is some of the best practice notification of videos. Um, so that's not really specific to us, but um, yeah, so it's, um, I think everyone's getting the industry as a whole and, and back to the, you know, I would definitely push if you're if talking to manufacturers, make sure that they have a, a product specific EPD, mm -hmm. and then, you know, if you're not aware of this, EPDs can la are really good for five years. So I think we're getting to the point now with as changes are made with renewable energy and reduction in carbon intensity, hopefully manufacturers are updating their EPDs, not only are they product specific, but they're making them updated yearly or, or every couple of years as there's something legitimately changing in their supply chain or their process. That's a really big component of it. Um, yeah, there's another good question about the, the commission and we can build these great high efficiency designed buildings, but if they're not commissioned, you know, I always give it the, we bought, we take buildings that are so complex and we treat them like cars. You go buy a car and someone just hands you the keys and you just drive off the parking lot and have no idea how to use it, drive it, operate it. And buildings are that technology advanced where they really do need to be commissioned and tuned and operated correctly. I worked in an architecture office in Charleston. Um, we did geothermal heat wells and we did all these really high triple pane glass. Spent a fortune renovating this old AT&T industrial building. The first two months of our electricity bill was double the utility bill before we rented the building. And my boss and was literally almost hit the ceiling. He's like, what's going on? What's wrong here? The chiller was not was not even operating. The whole geothermal heat pump system had never been commissioned. It wasn't working properly. I mean, that's just a, a real world example of something that can yeah. derail. You know, we all we set out with the right intentions, but operationally, fell flat on our face day one. And I would I would say um, I'm not aware. I don't I don't know if you are, Brent. I'm not aware that there's any requirements in the code yet regarding envelope commissioning. I, I, um, I will uh, I will say in Michigan right now, um, I'll do a plug for some of the work that AI Michigan is doing a little bit. Um, the if, if everyone's not aware, the governor opened the energy code rules. Um, and so there's AI Michigan is pushing for the adoption of IEC 2021, which would incorporate ASHRAE 90.1 2019, I think, whatever the latest versions of those are. Um, and so to, to sort of touch on some of all these questions, um, the envelope pieces, if you look at the latest versions of that model energy codes, really haven't changed since our current 2013 90.1 here in Michigan, um, because those thermal envelopes to the point that's made, yeah, it's diminishing returns. I can put R60, R80 up on the roof, but at some point you're just paying for insulation that's really not impacting. You gotta start looking at detailing of thermal bridges um, and then also passive strategies and systems. Um, and so that's, 
that's something to keep in mind. And my my connection to AI Michigan and the code thing is partly to say to plug everyone. Hey, write your representatives, write your legislatures, um, talk to your code officials in your local jurisdictions. Um, obviously, AI is taking a stance of in order to mitigate some of the impacts of climate change, we should adopt a more stringent energy code. Um, I'm not for sure, and I'm not going to say one way or the other that there's a requirement of commissioning of the envelope. Um, but I think the writing is on the wall, as you've seen with the beginning requirements of energy modeling or um, performance metrics and um, pathways to have an energy efficient building coming out of code. I think it's probably not far off that it could become required. Um, and so that could also be a way that helps drive some of these higher levels of performance. Um, so. Yeah, to that question though, you're right. I, I don't, I'm not aware of any, it could be jurisdiction specific as you know, codes are adopted by cities and regions independently. Um, but other than LEED and you know, like Living Building Challenge and other certification schemes that, that do give you, they don't even require, it's just an additional, you know, if you're seeking additional points or other requirements. Mm -hmm mission pieces. I, I really wish they would. Um, and it maybe from the design, you know, you guys as, as practicing or from your end, it's something you put in your, your contract documents or something that you can recommend to clients because that's, they're paying for all this great design work and all this research and your professional guidance. If they're not operating the building, the way it was designed and intended, then that's that really for a horrible analogy, it go, literally goes out the window. I mean, <laughs> it, it's not, that's not what you're getting. Um, we kind of touched on Matt's question here, but I'm curious, Brent, from your perspective, what you see in the work you do, um, what are some of the major barriers you run into um, in trying to design envelopes to be aligned with some of these best practices that were discussed? Um, in fairness, it, it's for, for our side, um, Obviously, I sit within the insulated panel division. There's a lot of challenges. Let's give you a good example. There's a lot of um, kind of misunderstanding of how simple a panel can work versus we're very, a lot of us are just so used to doing built up systems with EFs and everything else, um, getting people to understand this, how simple it is that the dew point sits in the middle of the wall with an, what's an insulated panel is the air, water, vapor, thermal bearer all in one system. Um, there is no additional backup needed behind a panel. We get a lot of school projects. Can't tell you how many architecture firms I've been into and we'll say, yeah, we'd love the work. We want to do the panel. And then they're going to put like a CMU or a concrete wall behind the panel as a backup wall. And I'm like, I, mm. I don't understand why you want to do that. Um, or um, sometimes, and this gets tricky, sometimes either on retrofits or other projects where they want to put mineral fiber in the cavity uh, behind the panel, which can cause a lot of problems. So and building science consultants can sometimes go both ways, I've, which is weird. We've worked with Building Science Corp and others to sh for white papers and research, and some people will just still, you know, very much convinced that you need cavity insulation behind a panel, which it just doesn't work that way. Um, so, yeah, it's it's it, you know. As mentioned in some of there, it's not a one size fits all. It depends on the use intensity of the building, depends on the location, your you know climate zones. It's I live in the south <laughs> compared to where you guys are, yeah. so we're we've got extreme heat you know in the winter and hot and humid, and it it does get cold. I live in Charleston, it doesn't snow really, but it gets cold. Um, you know where do you put that thermal that the you know the AWB if you're not using a panel where you're controlling heat or keeping heat out? You know you have those both seasons coming in. Um, so the design strategies are, it's, I wish there was one sort of golden, you know, golden ticket, but I, there's not, you know? So it, it's, it is tough. And, and I, I'm interested to see, you. I'm sure you guys are aware of this, but New York City, um, you know, they're drastically changing how much their, their wall to window ratios. They don't want to see glass shard buildings put up anymore because they're just, the energy use intensity is absurd. I mean, yeah. you know, triple paint, I mean, it just then the amount of money spent to, to do these high performance glazings and these, you know, uh, these other facade systems, it's, it's just, it's kind of crazy. We just don't need to design. There's better ways to design and, and still get the daylighting views and still get the natural daylighting 
that we want. Yeah. Um, well, out of respect for everyone's time, I'll, I'll first say thank you to you, Brent, for your time today and your insights. Um, we appreciate your help with this. And um, do you wanna, I don't know if you wanna drop in the chat some contact info or we can yeah. share it with everyone after. Um, Happy to just make sure that's in there, right? Yep, yeah, feel free to reach out uh, with any kind of questions specifically, if it's not something I handle, um, I'll, we've got an internal um, technical resource team Happy to do that. Happy to support any project cigars. In fact, it's funny. We've got um, I'm sure you guys are familiar with Dry Design. Dry Design is right outside of where you guys are. Yeah. Uh, so they've they've got their main their headquarters up there, um, and that's a great. Those are always just beautiful projects with Dry Design on the outside and then insulated panels behind it, um, or rigid insulation. We Kingsman Insulation is the other division that we own. Um, but yeah, happy to help on any projects you guys have going on. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, so I'll do my plug sort of asking and challenging everyone. Will you sign the 2030 commitment today? Um, I think collectively, if we were to all sign on um, all of a sudden, you know, it doesn't become something that is talked about piecemeal between different firms, all of a sudden clients and everybody is going to be exposed to it and understand it. So, um, Please reach out, let, let either myself or Matt or any other members of our committee know how we can help with that. Um, I throw my resources slide up here. Um, I did add one that was sort of pertinent to today's session. Um, there's a great book I've been reading through called The New Net Zero by Maclay Architects. Um, for any of you technical nerds out there, there's a lot of great details in that book. Um, just on different ways to do base of wall details, top of wall details, just a, a range of different um, thoughts around details, but also sort of builds on what this video is talking about through thermal bridging and um, you know the four main control layers. So um, that's a good resource to check out. Um, so next month, August 24th, I'm looking forward to seeing everyone again. Um, we'll be doing employing passive systems for load reduction. Um, so thanks everyone and have a great rest of your day. Thanks. Thanks everyone. Cheers.